you look at the grouse moors, people come from the cities, the towns, they go to the rivers, they go to the moors, they go to go walking, enjoying everything that's there. It doesn't just happen. It's actually lots of work by lots of people, from the beaters, the picker-uppers, you know, the gillies, yeah, the keepers. It, it, it's, it's work in progress, continuous work in progress. If you look at the chain, the chain of, you know, from the hotels, the bed and breakfasts, to the taxi drivers, you know, it's, it's a business, and one that's worth over two billion pounds a year to the countryside. Well, one of the points Andrew Gilruth was just making, and, and you've just made, is, is the people side of shooting. And, and we haven't really heard that. We've heard a great deal about the conservation benefits, about the economic benefits. Uh, and, and it's nice to see that, that the kind of the social bit coming out. But I mean, there is a perception, because grouse shooting is expensive, that you know, it could be characterized as the new fox hunting. And, and you did address that in your article in the Daily Telegraph yesterday. Marie Antoinette, I think was the words I used, yeah. Um, look, you know, you can, everything has a tag. If you want to go and shoot uh, 400 pheasants, that's your choice, your pocket. Um, personally, I'm actually quite happy going out with the boys, and I've just got, I've actually got a war wound from a hawthorn bush in the hide on a two days pigeon shooting. Uh, Toffs don't do that, do they? No, no, right. But, um, but no, I got attacked by a hawthorn bush trying to, trying to jump up at this bird that was uh, flighting in. But, you know, um, it's, there's every way, shape and form. It's like fishing. You know, you can go, there's town water, you can pay a five pound ticket, and you've got just as much chance of catching as anybody else. So, um, no, I think that uh, that's a convenient ex you know, explanation, very convenient, uh, not based on a lot of fact. Now, you entered Parliament uh, last year as a peer, and you announced your brief to represent the country and represent other you know, un under underseen groups. When it comes to something like shooting, which is very dear to our hearts here, how do you put across uh, the importance of, of the social fabric of the countryside, of the fact that we are all people who, who love grass shooting? I remember being, as a kid, I started with an air rifle, and I see there's these ridiculous possibility of these rules coming in. You know, you have to be 18, I think, to, have a, to shoot an air rifle. You know, I was about 12. And you go down and you go rabbiting or whatever. And you learn how to use a gun, the safety of a gun, um, and how, you know, what you don't do is you don't point it around in the air and what have you. So it's part of the countryside education. And uh, for me, that's very, very important. Uh, and you progress through it. And you know, it's like fishing's the same. You know, first time I went down, Chudley's Mill in Yeovil down in Somerset, an old mill pool there catching things about this large, and it was great fun. Uh, and that's, uh, that started me off on fishing. So there's a starting point, and you can take it as far as you want. Um, personally, I would do it no more than six days a week. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you fishing and shooting? But I, I was brought up in Somerset, so uh, 14 years old, you were a relatively important part of my life. Um, were you fishing and shooting in Somerset when you, when you were playing down there? Oh yeah, very much so. I started, seriously, I'd, I'd been about 12 when I start, actually started to think about uh, many things, but uh, shooting and fishing were two of them. So when I went to the House uh, of Lords and I made this, uh, did my speech, introduction speech, the point I was trying to make was that I think we have all these groups, uh, nine of them, uh, representing the shooting fraternity, but they all have their own agendas, or had their own agendas until a couple of days ago. And now what we've done, and one of the things we worked on over the last year or so, was to bring those parties together. So strength is in numbers. So if we're all working for the same, uh, going in the same direction, uh, then I, I genuinely believe that uh, we become a force and we can then deal with people like you know, Wild Justice, you know, ex Extinction Rebellion, but you can fly a plane to out of Mongolia to go and get people to pay and go along with you, um, which Mr. Packham's apologized for. Well, you only apologise for digging once. So. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. And he says he won't do it again until the next time. Of course. <laughs> but, um, he wouldn't want to turn down a cheque like that, no. Yeah. Um, right, so you entered Parliament last year. Um, was there a certain amount of learning the ropes? I mean, you, you, it takes time to build a kind of base there, doesn't it? And, and, and that seems to be what you're doing. I mean, your, your, your article yesterday in Telegraph, which if, if you didn't see it, was 
partly to do with the announcement for uh, about aim to sustain the, the kind of wider group of all the shooting countryside organisations. Uh, that was a, a great call to action. Has it required you to kind of get support together in, in Parliament to allow you to do that, or is this just a momentum of what's happening? It's not just Parliament. Uh, you know, I, I you speak to people in the countryside, and they come up to me and they say, thank you for, you know, for looking after us, or trying to. And that's, that's the objective, it's because rural areas, uh, we're not in the city, we don't tell the people in the city what colour their buses should be, Equally, we expect the same respect with the countryside. And a lot of people have worked their way, whether they're farmers, uh, all the school children out there, the countryside's theirs, and they look after it. So I wanted to make that point quite clear. That um, there's this idea that you, you should, broadly speaking, leave the countryside, man leave management of the countryside to people who live there, people who are responsible for it. Uh, how do you get that across to, uh, you know, a, a, an urban majority who's seen it represented by Mark Avery here, who says, no, we are all voters, we are all taxpayers, we're paying subsidies, therefore we should have a say in, in, in how this is managed, even if we know nothing about it? Well, he's had a few says and it hasn't really come to much, has it? So, you know, I think, um, you know, you've got to stand on your own two feet and the, the whole thing of aim to sustain is that we become a force and we can then fight back. Rather than putting the fires out, we'll start lighting a few fires ourselves. It's like, you know, I live very close to the moors in North Yorkshire, and we've already had a fire up there in the hot weather. And if you don't look after the moors and you don't burn to uh, coal burn uh, to uh, keep it under control, there is going to be a tragedy. You continue with this weather, and not so much today, which is of light relief, I think, to most of us. But when you actually see what happens with the fire. I spent a lot of time, of my time in Australia uh, over the years, and I, I was actually caught in a, in a bushfire, a uh, wildfire, whatever you want to call it, and it is horrendous. You know, whatever the wind speed is, is the speed of the fire. And this is the same on the moors. It's exactly the same we saw with the Leeds Bradford. We've just had it in Cornwall recently, in winter, started by a barbecue. So we've got to look after it, and otherwise there's going to be a tragedy. You know, you're in a little village, and you've got moorland around you, and that fire gets out of control, you can't outrun it. Uh, as as w was made clear by Andrew Gilruth, the, the way that patchwork burning can solve that wildfire problem. Fire breaks. That's why you're creating fire breaks. But there is one issue in what you say, which, which I, I do want to pick you up on. As, as somebody from Somerset, why on earth do you live in Yorkshire? <laughs> if I had my way, I'd be further north. <laughs> uh, but uh, she who must be obeyed is not quite so keen on that. But anyway, uh, not so many shops up in uh, Sutherland, but uh, or Iway. But uh, but no, I, um, my roots are in Yorkshire. Um, I was brought up in Somerset because my father was in the navy and was on active service in Ireland. And when, my, uh, when I was born, my mum was shipped over to Heswall in Cheshire. And uh, you birth then you go back and join the uh, family of my father. And then he came out of the uh, Navy and went to Western Helicopters and in Yeovil. So consequently, my life, I don't remember any of the early parts, uh, but I remember from Yeovil onwards. Uh, but then I wanted to get back to my roots. Um, they don't want to speak like that all day long, see? Um, yeah. Well, you, you played um, you played football for Scunthorpe, but you did rather better playing cricket for Somerset, I think, didn't you? Oh, without doubt, yeah. <laughs> but actually, I'm president of Scunthorpe now, so there you go. Next uh, August the seventh, first home game, and I'll be there. But um, no, I, look, I love all my sport, um, uh, not just field sports. But um, I'm not quite into synchronised swimming. And I struggle a little bit with that equestrian stuff, but you know, horses dancing. I thought it was very remarkable, but it was a bit like watching paint dry. But, um, but no, I love, I love all, most of the sports. Uh, always have done. You're brought up in it, and the countryside sport is a very important part of your life. Let's go back to the sport of grouse shooting. Um, we had a significant success, which strangely Mark uh, Avery didn't uh, mention at all, which was. I would say a real drubbing for wild justice uh, in a Westminster Hall debate in Parliament about a month ago, and a better result for grouse shooting, driven grouse shooting, than we got when he asked the same question of our petition in 2016. 16, yeah. How did how did that how did that come about? Because that seemed to be a triumph of, of getting it all together in the Houses of Parliament. 
Well, it, it, it's another trouncing, but the, the reason is, you, so there were two Labour MPs who spoke, both ladies. Um, when one of them mentioned the fact that uh, all that you're bringing all those grouse chicks in from France, I thought, okay, all right, that sums it up for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Quite remarkable, those French. But, um, but no, uh, when you hear that, I thought, well, this just, it's, um, the people are uneducated. You know, as I said earlier, pavement warriors. And um, that's fine. But um, if they keep on making mistakes like that, their credibility goes out the window and things move on. But it seems to be a, a wonderful moment for shooting in a way. You know, we have we have that base, and you and you've just said it. And Aim just is saying is 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 a way forward. One of the things I hear a lot from people in the countryside is you know, gamekeeping is is a job that looks after wildlife. It looks after game for shooting, but it also looks after wildlife. Can we capitalise that? Is no other time to say gamekeepers should be in charge of all Britain's wild places instead of handing the contract to the RSPB? Well, the RSPB, um, there you go, there's 200 sites the RSPB have, and they have not issued any numbers on their reserves for 10 years. That's bird numbers. Exactly, yeah. So we don't know how they're doing. Well, we do know how they're doing because they're not <laughs> issuing numbers, so we know there's not many around. And the reason for that, if you don't control the predators, ground predators, and uh, you don't look after your birds, they're, going, they're easy prey and consequently they're not stupid, they don't come back. So they can move on and where they're, where they're breeding, grouse, uh, there were 60 chicks of uh, hen harriers grown, uh, born last year. Uh, most, all, I think 12 out of 17 uh, moors were responsible for that. Grouse moors manage moors. And that is because the vermin is controlled. So grouse moors are the reason we, we are doing better for hen harriers than ever before. We, we, saw, we saw Mark Avery go in on raptor persecution and he kept talking about the model, but that felt a bit like yesterday's debate because the numbers of, of prosecutions are, are, are hitting the floor, aren't they? This has been a big vehicle to turn around. Massive, massive. And we've we said all along that with zero tolerance. Uh, there are, you don't have to do it. Uh, it's not necessary. N Nature has a way of looking after itself and it sort of balances things out over time. Careful, you sound like a rewilder. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> There's one thing I'm not. But uh, no, I just think that if you look what the gamekeepers do on the moors, uh, they control it, the peat is looked after, which is quite an important part of our moorland life. Um, the, the moors are controlled as you, with fire breaks. Everything is done to give the birds that chance. Plovers, curlews, numbers are way up, but that on land that is looked after. By so, keepers. By keepers. So have we sufficiently made the case to say to government, we are the ones, perhaps for our aim to sustain, we are the ones who should be looking after the British countryside? I think, uh, I think it's in the interest of everybody that loves the countryside of the UK. Um, why wouldn't you? You'd like to go down the river and see a trout rise or a salmon jump, and you go on the grass once you see grass pick up and go. Um, you're plovers. And they, there's plenty of birds of prey up there, but they learn to live with each other. We, we had a situation on a moor, which I won't name for obvious reasons, and they had three nesting hen harriers on the moor. It's a big moor, and uh, the RSPB, well, we want to see them. Uh, the keeper said, well, no. He said, because we don't need to show you them, and you'll, you have a habit of getting a little bit too close, walking onto the nest almost, and consequently, that's the end of that breeding pair. So um, we kept it ourselves, and we were successful with five chicks. So, uh, and it's great. I love seeing the hen harriers, or hawks. I was down in Norfolk shooting the pigeons. I said marsh harriers, you know, flying around us while we're actually shooting pigeons. It, it's fantastic. And that's not the picture of a, of a shooter that, that, that Wild Justice likes to paint. You know, you, you, you are, a, a, you are a more, I mean, in that respect, more of a modern shooter, aren't you? Uh, the, uh, somebody 30 years ago would probably not be saying that. They might be making a joke about uh, you know, how, we, how we do shoot peregrines or we do shoot hen harriers, but that, that seems to have changed in that time. For a number of reasons. In actual fact, um, the supermarkets now have signed up uh, to put uh, game on their shelves, not battery-raised chickens in many cases. And 
we have to thank Chris Packham for that. And uh, he attacked it and said that, you know, this is a ridiculous life. These chickens live for three weeks or whatever it is, five weeks, and they're in a cage, and next thing they're on a shelf in a supermarket. It's appalling. And people said, really? Well, why aren't we eating game? And so they push the game on. And that's what Aim to Sustain is really all about, is educating people. Which would you rather have? You know, a fresh, uh, beautiful pheasant that's lived a, a normal, natural life, uh, and you're eating that, or do you want a chicken that's never seen daylight? Uh, and for me, it, it's just common sense. And those birds, you know, my, we, we, we had a go at rearing a few birds and putting them down at home. And I think the percentage was about 80% survived and 20% were, were unlucky because you know, it, it's just uh, the odds. It's the way that you help the countryside as well because these birds that don't go, you can ship them two or three years later. And it's, if you go on a grass moor in, early in the year, you can see the mature, stronger birds rather to the, the floppy joes that have just come out off the nest. So again, selective shooting. I don't think we're going to get a ripple of applause for Chris Packham here, I'm afraid, despite what, what, whatever you say. Oh, I'd like to thank him. <laughs> yeah, no, like still him. nothing. No. <laughs> well, you can't say I was biased, and didn't he? I didn't <laughs> point it out. No. So let's uh, just 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 on that. So when, when you're dealing with Parliament, um, we shooters often, f I think, beat ourselves up. I don't think personally unnecessarily about big bag days. Um, when we're explaining to people who don't understand, to urban MPs, is the characterisation still very much kind of one for the pot? Is is the kind of the perfect place for? It, that's that's what politicians will back. Uh, whereas if you are talking about uh, larger commercial shooting, or do they just not make a distinction? One of the hot, most horrific things I saw thirty years ago, uh, a shoot. I won't name, but they they shot something like seven hundred birds in the day of which 650 were buried in the ground. I was appalled, uh, and I refused to shoot there. Uh, and I told them quite clearly I didn't. We actually were looking at putting a syndicate on that estate that was pulled immediately, and we moved away from it. That is what sh is the bad side of shooting, but I don't think that happens very much now. And certainly with the game birds going into the supermarkets, uh, which is where we should have been anyway, not just the odd butcher in the high street in Yeovil, for instance, selling you know, a brace of uh, pheasant. We, you've got to, common sense is quite an important thing in shooting, but to do that, that just, I find that appalling and I'm a shooter and I don't want to do it. I think uh, the bags are a choice, personal choice, but um, providing the birds are shot for a reason. And all the birds, like the, we were pigeon shooting, they say, every single pigeon that was shot was chilled and went straight to the game dealer there by seven o'clock that evening, eight o'clock that evening after we shot. So uh, you, you, you've got to put a little bit of um, real, reality to it. And, and I think shooting 750 pheasant for a bit of fun is not, I, wouldn't, I don't call that fun, I call that barbaric. Well, reality seems to be your, your, your main point. So, so well, the, the, the point about you know, voting with your feet if you see something on a shoot you don't like, I mean, that's why things change. I mean, it might take a season or two to change, but it will change. So where, where do you stand on something like uh, Ned Shot, for example? I've not met, I've not uh, heard, I would say I wouldn't have met them, but I've not heard of anyone that's ever died of lead poisoning from eating pheasant, to be quite frank. Uh, point small, one. small cheer there or no cheer at all? Okay, one thing that I do know which is encouraging from that point of view regarding the shot, that the cartridge manufacturers for the last four years saw this coming because of European legislation. But I thought we'd left the EU, so I'm not quite sure we have to do it anyway. Um, who cares what the French do? We didn't but, get Nigel Farage on for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what they've been doing is they've been experimenting with steel and they fact, what they've been trying to do is produce a softer steel. Uh, so it's not going to damage the barrels. Uh, one of the problems has been with the, the wad uh, to get the to shot to stay together uh, uh, in pattern. Uh, but they think they've cracked it now. So there's um, a lot of tests going on. They've changed the actual wadding now to uh, it's organic. So it will, uh, it, it, it dissolves, it disappears. You don't have to pick it up. Um, which is what uh, fibre does anyway, but uh, steel and fibre don't go particularly well together. So they've modified it now. So there is, I think we'll, and also a sensible price. Not like when the shot, first steel shot came out and there was 
that's 100 quid a box, which is quite ridiculous, ridiculous but uh, it will be competitive. And from what I've heard, the tests, people, are, the gun, the, um, gun makers are quite pleased because the, the barrels aren't going to get blown to smithereens. But more importantly, it's patterning well, and uh, you're using um, smaller smaller shots, so you might go 26 gram, 28 gram, rather than 34 gram, but get the same result with steel. So that's, that, that seems to me to be exactly it. The cartridge companies are coming up with the solutions. They might have felt uncomfortable about the speed at which they had to do it, but they're doing it. Now, going back to January, um, we had a, a point where uh, the usual suspects criticised us for not making the change fast enough. We had the announcement last year from the organisations it would take five years to phase out lead. January, they say, you're not going fast enough. Immediately, Rebecca Power from DEFRA says, well, I will consider banning it outright by a statutory instrument. So is this where you now have to step into dull meetings with DEFRA to, to, to turn that around? What's your role here? I think DEFRA will be very happy to listen to us because we will actually be a force, not a, an individual party. And DEFRA will be part of that if they want to be. And if they don't want to be, then they'll find themselves isolated, uh, which is, they certainly don't want that. So, um, yeah, look, you know, that's the, that's the whole point of bringing this aim to sustain together, to give us a voice, a big voice, a powerful voice. Uh, we'll bring in, a, uh, eventually we'll bring in an independent chairman, which I think is very important, uh, than going around each group having it for so many months each time, which I've never quite got my head around. A chairman for three months and then someone else has a go and then someone else has a go. Um, there's no unity. So bringing in an a, a individual who will chair the group uh, as a whole makes a lot more sense so um yeah there's we're moving in the right direction defra they made a few mistakes just recently and uh, that's certainly one of them and really a pretty dumb thing to say i don't really know what you're trying to achieve by that so you're not going to scare the shooting fraternity because it's there well that seems to be one of the, the, the this, this thing with this article yesterday it, it, it felt a little bit if i may say like heading the 1981 that there was a there was a moment of confidence which we needed yesterday we we as the shooters need that feeling that we're getting the representation we're on the side of the, the righteous uh, and that we are winning this argument and i don't think we've really felt that very much over the last two years I, is it really about confidence do you think i think confidence and also when you look at the groups or the amalgamated group it is powerful you build a war chest and that war chest allows you to fight a lot of these things right as i said right earlier on let's start lighting a few fires not just continuously putting them out you know when corvids were slipped under the wire late on one evening and suddenly you, you know you need a license to shoot pigeons and you need you can't it's ridiculous living in the countryside you would never people in the countryside would never agree with that that when you see lambs coming out of the womb and their eyes are taken out uh, it's horrendous and farmers I was up in uh, central Scotland one farmer in one week lost 32 lambs to ravens and he's only allowed to shoot three ravens a year it's nuts now um, while we're on that subject I, I just keep catching the eye of Jeff Garage here who's National Gamekeepers Organisation in the front row who's you know, one of the country's top no, best known gamekeepers and yet I know he wants me to talk about cricket he's not interested in gamekeeping at all <laughs> but I was going to throw you one more question please about, about that so there is a sense that you can release predators okay not wolves but you can release sea eagles which are absolutely enormous white-tailed eagles this seems on the face of it, I mean, from a farming point of view, to be relatively irresponsible. And yet we haven't found a voice to say that it should, should not take place. How do we do that? Well, you can start with beavers, if you want. Yeah, it's causing chaos on the rivers in Scotland. Yeah, suddenly, you can't replace the 300-year-old tree when the beavers have gone under the bank. And it's going to cause all kinds of problems down the line. And that needs addressing. Um, but one of the things I said in my maiden speech uh, was that uh, what I want to see is the uplands and the lowlands come together as a unit and Scotland in particular needs a lot of help at the moment um, um, Sturgeon has got some pretty bizarre ideas uh, we won't cross that bridge just now but um, but I think to, to you need to bring them together because again it's about a bigger strength and a bit more unity so um, that's certainly I think that most keepers I think would like to see happen 
And if you have a conference, and we put it together when we can, in normal times, um, you put it together, instead of having just the northern, and the, or the uplands and lowlands, what you want is everyone there, uh, representing different regions of it, and then having a constructive debate, and, and put, making a plan. How are we going to fight this? How are we going to deal with it? Um, one of the things I find with the stories about the raptors, just hinting back to that, it, I always find it quite amazing. Yeah, of course, there is the odd rogue. But I always find it quite strange that the raptors that are being poisoned or whatever, are always next to a footpath yeah. or in the middle of a dual carriageway on a stick. Now, I, I've never quite worked out how that happens. Maybe the poison makes them do stupid things. I don't know, but it, it, it doesn't make sense to me. And, and I think that that's something else we need to look at because the gamekeepers are not always the guilty party. I love this idea of being on a front foot. We, we have toyed with the idea of, you know, playing the victim, but, but it, front foot seems to be your message. So let's answer Jeff's questions. And, and can I take you back 40 years? W was that a question of confidence? Obviously, skill might have played a small part, but when you went in... Very so, small part. <laughs> what was it about just thinking, I can do this? Uh, There's an element of luck. Um, but if you think back in 81, uh, the country was in turmoil. We had the, half the cities were on fire with the race riots, uh, the miners strike, uh, economy going down the drain, and the country needed something, and we just happened to be there at the right time, right place. Uh, but it certainly changed my life um, in 1981. Um, there was a not wedding. always for the better. <laughs> there was a wedding that summer. That <laughs> A bit thinner those in those days as well, yeah. As my wife reminds me. Um, I'll keep going as much as I enjoy it. <laughs> the good old days. The good old days. Are you happy to take a couple of questions from the audience? Absolutely. Yeah, wonderful. Absolutely. Okay, let's 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 throw this open. But I'd like to ask you something, Mr. Chair. Well, going back to um to Mark Avery, which unfortunately wasn't allowed to uh, ask questions. He kept on about public money in the uplands. <laughs> Will. The, will there ever be the amount of money that the private investor puts into Grails Moors, um, uh, you know, put in there? And also, he didn't give any examples of any RSPV moors that outshine any Grails Moors on production of wildlife and conservation. Well, the answer to the second part is quite simple. There isn't any. So that, that's quite straightforward. And, uh, there isn't a single Grails Moor that's uh, ridiculous RSPV. They've got a lot of things to... Uh, they need to stick their hands up and say we've got this wrong and we need to improve things. So, um, what was the first part of the question? Sorry, it get, it happens when well, Mark kept on about um, the public putting money into yeah. the uplands, and, and I said, will it ever um, be as much as what the private investor is already putting in there? Well, I'm not quite sure where you know, Mark Avery is always saying, uh, and I've heard him say this on many occasions, and and, and Chris Packham and other people, Wild Justice, uh, the, these groups, and they continuously say government money, government money. The government has, hasn't got a lot of money at the moment because it's just had a massive 18 month uh, pandemic to deal with. So realistically, um, one of the things that will happen with the aim to sustain is that we will have a war chest and we'll put that in the right places and we'll do our utmost to protect everybody concerned. So that, yes, in other words, yeah, we, I think that this new uh, group will be able to help uh, not just legally, but finan financially down the line as well, I'm sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Any more questions? Hello, Ian. What, Hi. What do you think of the, um, the new 100 cricket? Well, as chairman of Durham, I should know a bit more about it than I do. But, um, but I'll be honest with you, um, I actually haven't watched a game of it yet. Uh, I like the principle, and I, and I think that um, the great thing is you're always looking for a way to bring the youngsters into the grounds. And youngsters have a concentration span, a bit like me now, of about two or three hours. And so the, the T20 was a stepping stone, the 100 is a variation, and if it's gonna get kids in, the next generation of cricketers, then I think it's a good thing, and I really do. But I will emphasize one thing, the ultimate in, for any cricketer is to play test cricket. The reason it's called test cricket, because it tests you for five days, mentally, physically, tactically, you can lose a day, but you can still win the match. 
So I think that's what makes test cricket so um, the ultimate demand. Anybody that says when they start playing cricket they don't want to play test cricket is telling lies. Because the ones, a lot of players that play T20 and the 100 will be the same. There'll be a lot of very good players in there, but there's also guys who just, that's all they do is they go around the world playing T20. Good luck to them, but the reason they're doing that is they're not good enough to play test cricket most of them. Do you agree about the 100? Yes, I do. I, I got so much enjoyment, and I'm good. sure other people did, in seeing so many children there and getting so excited. And that's what's going to lead up into, into them going into cricket, I'm yeah. sure, in more sports. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other thing that we've been doing at Durham for the last few years, when we were allowed live uh, crowds, was uh, from four o'clock every afternoon when kids come out of school, free of charge get them into the grounds with their bats and balls. They've got big areas around the back of the ground and they might watch the cricket for 10 minutes, but they'll be playing cricket out the back, which is just as important. Bring, bringing it back to shooting, I hear a great deal from, uh, from our viewers on Phil's channel about how not enough young people are coming into the sport, which I, again, I disagree with that, but what, what do you, what's your thought about that? I think 10 years ago, they might've had a point, uh, but I think the one thing we need to make sure it doesn't happen is this air rifle discussion uh, but yeah I think um, you know game fairs like this I, I watch my two grandsons here and they, they look at three things guns uh, the souped up pickups up there they think they're great and they like the Polarises uh, and that's about it and then they go straight over and get a few um, you know healthy food but healthy food you know waffles and things like that yeah um, but yeah, no, I, I think it's important. I think things like this are a great showcase for the country father and country people. I think everybody else recognises that experience. Would anybody else like to ask a question? I'd just ask, like to ask you what your opinion of the reintroduction of red kites is, because we live on the Oxfordshire, Berkshire border. They're constantly circling in big numbers over the town, and the songbird population seems, seems to have di diminished considerably. Uh, yeah, I, look, I think it is a problem. Um, I think uh, a friend of mine at, at a Wickham has a plane that he flies and they are continuously getting bird strikes and it's red kite. So, um, look, yeah, I, I think that the reintroduction of animals that haven't been there with birds, animals, fish, whatever, is always a little dangerous. There's sometimes a good reason that, for instance, with beavers, that they haven't been around for 400 years. Let the Canadians have it and they can have all the floods. Yeah, it's good. But uh, no, I, I think um, you've got to be careful. And if this is where but nature, you know, we, we interfere too much with nature and it can bite you on the bum. But wouldn't you say, if, I mean, if you're going to bring something in, like a seagull or a red kite or a beaver, there should be a management plan attached to it as well? There has to be. There has to be a management plan. And I don't think with the red kites, I think it's getting out of hand. I, I, you know, people are getting bombed by these things and uh, you know it is a problem and it's a problem that we've created so now we have to manage it and solve it and are we heading towards a point where there is enough trust to say gamekeepers should be the one who do that who are the wildlife managers for the nation not just the game managers again i think uh, common sense it will prevail i hope and uh, you know th there's room for everything uh, it, but you've got to control it and sometimes it needs a little bit of help but more often than not they do balance out uh, we've seen that with the moors that have been managed with the curlews and the, you know, the, the numbers are up, you know, so, so many, uh, which is great. And, you know, golden plovers and, you know, they're fantastic birds to see. And, you know, you're getting the, when you start seeing a hen harrier or a, a goshawk and things like that, it, 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 there's room for everybody. Another question. I am um, just wondering what your thoughts are on the recent announcement on the uh, planned move away from badger culling. Uh, whether you're planning to do anything to counter that. To be honest, to be honest with you, I, I don't know enough about it, but I'm certainly something I'll look at because uh, yesterday afternoon when I was here, someone came up to me and said, I've just lost my whole herd. And it's all, you know, that's, that's, that's a big, big thing to happen to any farmer, massive. And so I, I think there needs to be a lot more uh, work done on that. Um, personally, uh, I think, again, if TB is... A, that big a problem, then we need to act. How you do it, I don't know. But again, it's decisions made by people sitting in urban UK, not the people 
who are out there and working and seeing what happens. So I think maybe the shift of power needs to perhaps move a bit more to the countryside. You've suddenly been asked to become an expert on an awful lot of things. In a very short, if only my schoolmasters could have seen me now. They used to write, they used to write every, oh, if only he tried. Yeah. Uh, sport is not everything. Well, actually it is, but yeah. Uh, but, um, but no, uh, no, I'm actually enjoying it. Uh, and I don't see any point in doing, taking on a job like this in the house unless you're going to try and make a difference. And I said I'd try and make a difference, and I will try and make a difference uh, for the people of the countryside. Well, Lord Botham, I think you are.